All right, so they've kind of seen a little bit of the clinic, but I really want you to have the opportunity to tell them how did Revolution get started? Yeah, boy, that was a, <laughs> it's a, it's a long story. And I'll try and make it as, as short as I can. <clears throat> Active duty military as a physician, uh, I did a traditional family medicine residency program um, and, and got some of the best training in the world. I was very comfortable running an ICU. Uh, I felt comfortable going and working in the emergency room. Um, I had delivered you know, well over 100 babies during my residency and, and shortly thereafter. And so I was comfortable in a broad spectrum of things. Uh, but I remember my commander when I was in 5th Special Forces Group coming to me and saying, um, hey, doc, I need prolotherapy. And I thought that I had had a pretty good uh, broad training and I had no idea what prolotherapy was. And so we had to do some research and uh, the PA that was working for me was uh, did some research and found a guy in Nashville that did prolotherapy. And a uh, short story, he, he got my commander's elbow taken care of, but he, he came and told us a couple of things uh, th this is prolotherapist, uh, Dr. Johnson, he runs Prolotherapy Nashville. If you're in the Nashville area uh, in Tennessee, uh, he is phenomenal. Uh, I cannot recommend him high enough. Um, I'll put a link in the, in the show notes for how you could get in touch with him. Um, but he came up, he was kind enough to come up and give us a, an in-service on prolotherapy, meaning just here's a... Oh, so you got a quick snapshot right there. Exactly. Okay. Of, of what is prolotherapy. Now, he said a couple of things that really kind of rocked my world. I was an athletic trainer in college, and we had T-shirts that said, just ice it. Ooh. And then, yeah. you know, as an Army medic, um, we had... Uh, my mom said, know, rub some dirt on it. Right? Go ahead. <laughs> so, as, as an Army medic, we had uh, Ranger candy, which was Motrin. So, mm. you, you just, you'd pass out Motrin, you know, by the oh, handfuls, and it's just... Yeah, so somebody comes in, it's good for what <laughs> ails you, you know. So, ice and Motrin is kind of like you know, uh, duct tape and 550 cord. You can fix anything with those things. Right. So this guy said, you know, I, he would never use ice right after an injury and whatever you do, don't ever use anti-inflammatories. And it really Deflate. blew, I mean, it blew me mind. And I thought, um, I thought this guy's either crazy or brilliant. And I don't know which one, but I'm going to have to figure this out. So I started doing some research and lo and behold, the guy was right. Uh, the research that was there uh, was completely different than than what I had been taught or what we do. Sure. Um, so um, that's kind of how I got my eyes open to prolotherapy, but then I started seeing patients that had uh, some things like retropatellar knee pain or plantar fasciitis, and these things were very difficult to treat, um, you know, in a, in a family medicine environment, you know, well, there's a few things that we can do. We can say you need physical therapy. There's a couple of things that we can do, but we just don't get good results with them in general. And so I thought I had a patient that came in and she was a runner. And I said, well, there's this thing that's new to me. It's not new, but it's new to me. Uh, we can give it a try. And she was like, let's do it. So did the injections and she came back and she said, that, that completely fixed my problem. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, that's, that's interesting. You know, uh, a single patient that it made a, a huge difference. And uh, the short story, I started doing this procedure and I saw that it worked in a way like nothing else worked. So I figured if I'm going to, if I'm going to get into prolotherapy and do this and offer this as a procedure for my patients, I better know what I'm talking about. And I need to know what the research shows. Mm -hmm. So I started looking at the research and the research said that prolotherapy didn't work. Now I have a real problem because mm -hmm. my patients are walking out fixed in a way that I couldn't do at all before. And like this was, it was extremely compelling that this stuff doesn't work w well, it works extremely well. Uh, one of the best things that I've ever seen, but the research shows that it doesn't work. So why? So I had to dig into the research and figure out what's, what's going on. I've got some information and it- Oh, it, Pandora's it, box. Exactly. So, and that's exactly what it was. Once you start opening that box and you start looking, um, you know, at, at the man behind the wizard, so mm. to speak, it just, it, it, it changed everything for me. And it wasn't that, you know, when the, when the literature for prolotherapy, when they said it doesn't work, it's not that there's a conspiracy or that, uh, it, it's just getting that kind of information. And we'll probably have to do another show on 
prolotherapy and the research behind it, but yeah. um, it's very difficult to get a randomized placebo-controlled double-blinded study that Ooh. shows, right, mm. uh, that, that shows in, if I'm doing an injection into a patient, then I know I'm doing an injection. You can give me two different solutions, but when you're comparing, it, it, it doesn't work, and again, we'll go into that into an, in another right. video, but uh, you can't draw that conclusion. And as I started, so uh, that that kind of started in, it started me questioning. Traditional medicine, like well, what you had been trained? It's, it started questioning the, the medical literature okay. that I can't necessarily just take it for face value that here's the research that comes out and it shows that you should put patients on medication X. And I'm like, well, maybe, maybe there's more to it than that. Mm. And so then as I had patients um, that came in with different conditions, it, it caused me to question, why am I doing what I'm doing? Uh, my ex-wife uh, was, uh, I don't remember how old she was at the time, but you know, in her 20s, uh, coming up on 30, and uh, she was uh, feeling bad and not sleeping well and had depression and taking different medications for all these things. And as we went to her doctor, who was um, the spouse of one of my colleagues, uh, uh, she said, you know what, you're just another year older. And I was like, what kind of crap is that? 30? And that's your best answer is you're just getting another year older? Right. How are we doing the right thing here? This is bull crap. And, and I wasn't okay with that. So we started looking into this and we started looking at thyroid and how are we managing thyroid and how are we managing fatigue? And when people mm -hmm. come in, and, you know, once you start thinking about this, you start having flashbacks in your brain about the patient that came in and said, um, you know, I was on that medication and it caused this. And you're like, oh, it can't cause that. And you're like... All the clues oh. are being dropped and now you're going back and picking right. up the breadcrumbs. Right. It's, oh, gosh. It's like that, you know, the there's a, a Walking Dead episode where, um, is it Gabriel? The uh, the guy with the bow staff? So they were going to, um, yeah, they were fighting the saviors, but they were going to pay their whatever it was and and turn the stuff in. They had to give, I think, six cantaloupes or something. Mm. And the guy counted them, and there were only five. And um, the short story is another guy manipulated the whole scenario so that it would kind of start this. So actually they would kill him, and then it, it was a big deal. But as Gabriel started thinking through this, he started putting all the pieces together, and he was like, holy cow, this was all a manipulation. Right. And so as we start looking at the literature, it's not that I'm not a conspiracy theorist. And I don't think that the pharmaceutical industry has a conspiracy to harm anyone or anything like that. But we have to understand they are a business. They are in business to sell drugs, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. They are not draw doing it. They're not your best friend. They are not doing it for the good of humanity. They are doing it for money, money. period. There's nothing wrong with that, but we have to understand it. And then as I got to thinking back about my medical education, not my not my residency and not my medical school, but anything outside of that. I go to a conference. Oh, who's sponsoring it? Who's sponsoring it? Yeah. Who's paying for it? Who's getting there giving this lecture? Yeah. What dinner is you know going on here? And again, I'm not opposed to all of any of those things. But you need to know. You but need we, to be aware. We yes, and we need to understand that this is a it is an inherently biased proposition. The m a vast majority of the time, when you look at the medical literature. Who paid for the medical literature? Mm -hmm. You know, there's the trial. Uh, I mentioned it in in um, you know one of the other video clips that we had showing the clinic around the tax trial, the trial to assess chelation therapy. Now, I think they started that trial um, to try and prove that chelation didn't work for cardiovascular disease, it and it showed that that diabetic patients actually benefited fairly significantly, and even the ones that they said chelation didn't work for, it worked better than statins. And so it, there's, there's just this whole, this whole thing, and you have to look at... Now, that, that study was funded by the NIH, National Institutes of Health. So that was a governmentally funded study, and there was no, um, no one's standing to make money okay. uh, from that study. But when you look at you know, a, a statin, Lipitor, most of those trials are put together by the company that made Lipitor. Uh, the, and in the past, uh, this is not the case now, but in the past, if you started a study and didn't like the outcome, you could just flush it. You didn't have to publish. 
Now that's not so much the case, but it's going to take decades to get a real solid foundation of the medical literature of accurate or, you know, of good data where this trial worked, this trial didn't. And sometimes we get trials that are like, shoot, what do we do with that? But good scientists take the good and the bad and, and try and put together what is the truth. But when you figure the drug industry, they've got a, you know, they've got a, um, some skin in the game because they're trying to sell their drug. Again, not, I don't have a problem with that, but we have to understand it. So as I just started opening Pandora's box and seeing that we're not doing stuff right, we are, I can't tell the 30 year old female that comes in and says, I'm tired, fatigued, depressed, can't sleep and say, well, it's just another year older or uh, you're crazy or you know, you're depressed and so you need a depression medication. It's, have we looked at their hormones? Is, are their hormone, and I'm not talking get, get your serum hormones tested one day of the month and say, oh, everything looks fine and walk away. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about how is that stuff actually functioning right. on a day-to-day basis? You may be perfect and spot on on day 19 through 21 of your cycle in your serum, but if your rhythm is off, everything's off. Yeah. And... Uh, that messes up your sleep. And if your adrenals are out, then that has an influence on those other hormones. And if the thyroid's out, that coordinates all of this other stuff. And if the adrenals are out, it wears the thyroid. And the thyroid wears the adrenals, and that plays a role with all these other hormones. And so everything plays together. And if you imagine a spider web with all these attachment points, um, and if you come along and grab one piece of that and pull, it messes up the whole web. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have the same picture. And you can't come and try and pull one of the other strings and say, we're going to fix that. Oh, it's like a snag in my sweater. Exactly. Right? And it just oh. keeps unraveling and unraveling and unraveling. And then I try to pull and hide it, and it just it doesn't ever go right. back. Exactly. And so the human body is incredibly complex, and it is very arrogant to say that we understand it in its entirety. But we can look at it from a holistic perspective. We can start really putting pieces together. And sometimes I think from a medical perspective, we will miss the forest for the trees and we'll see, um, you know, we'll, you feel bad, we'll get your labs, oh, your TSH is off, let's put you on Synthroid. And we give you the one pill and we walk away. And then if that doesn't work, oh, well, you didn't take it right or, you know, it couldn't be that we didn't address this in its entirety. Yeah, it's not me. And sometimes, you know, it's very difficult to identify is this a thyroid problem? Is this an adrenal problem? Is it a this problem? Sometimes the problem can be so subtle as to not show up on the radar. And so um, you can spend a lot of money testing and sometimes we'll find an answer, but sometimes we need to ignore the problem and focus on health instead of saying, okay, well, you have something going on. You have a complaint that I can't put a handle on. I can't put a name on it yet. Mm. Other than I can call we it love, fatigue. We love our names. Right. Uh, well, that's that's how the medical world functions. We love labels. The need a I see, you need, a, di- you need yes. a diagnosis and a diagnosis code. And we've all been trained. Exactly. And if it doesn't work under a diagnosis code, then you can't get paid. Right. In a traditional medical world. You can't get a bill world. for it. And exactly. So, so those so, slap labels. And uh, so sometimes we just need to focus on health. And what is it? We know that... In general, we know generally what makes people healthy. Proper nutrition, proper rest, recovering from rest, reducing stress, good exercise and movement and all of those kinds of things. So if we can't figure this out, maybe we need to focus more on this. And how many patients... where I come in. Right. And how many times have you seen people that you addressed those things and their problem either completely went away or dramatically improved? Oh, yeah. We're cutting insulin. We're... Oh, numbers are improving across the board. And not even... That aside, the reports of just feeling better, more energy, um, you know, fogs lifting, all of those kind of phrases and and descriptions, that's what it's about. Yeah, it's it's the coolest thing in the world. Yes, so it is. as as a really long foundation to that, but I'll get kind of how did it how did revolution yeah. start? So it's it started with me, uh, and and me figuring out that I, I can't continue once Pandora's box was opened. I can't go back. You know, mm, you can't. You seen behind the curtain. Right. So you, um, when I got off uh, active duty military 
you know, moved back to Tulsa, Oklahoma, went to work for Warren Clinic. And I, I love the people at Warren Clinic. Um, I, I think they do uh, some fantastic work. I think they're really, really good people. But I couldn't do that. I couldn't work in a large system where I have to do things the way pretty much everybody else has to do it. It just... I know. <laughs> it just... It, it, it wasn't going to work. And so I... It came back to prolotherapy, and um, you know, within a month or two of being at Warren Clinic, I knew that I couldn't stay here. And I had a one-year contract, so I started planning my clinic that day. And uh, that within a month or two of being there, uh, I just I saw the writing on the wall, and I said, I can't, I can't stay here. And um, nothing against them, but it it just wasn't a good match. I wasn't good for them; they weren't good for me. And so we started planning Revolution Health and Wellness Clinic on October 1st of 2012. Mm. Uh, we opened Revolution Health and Wellness Clinic. A, a uh, did not take insurance at all, and um, you know, with a, um, with a whole lot of prayer, uh, opened our clinic and uh, got us taken care of us through through a lot, through a whole lot, um, and we've had some major adversities that I, without his assistance, there's, I don't see how we would have survived otherwise. Okay, so why should a patient who's looking for functional medicine choose you, choose revolution above any other option available to them? Well, I would say that our history speaks for itself. Um, our focus, our goal is to take every, each individual patient that walks through that door and do the best we can to identify what is going on, why do you feel the way you feel, and try to resolve that. Now, we have multiple limitations, uh, and it's very individual for the patient. So, um, do they have insurance? What will their insurance pay? Now, we don't take insurance, but the labs, many of the labs do. Okay. So in order to get the answer, it can be very, very expensive. So we have to work within the realm of what the patient can afford and is willing to spend. Okay. Uh, now, I take it very seriously that we need to be good stewards of how we ask that patient to spend their money. Some, pa some places I've seen, uh, you know, in other states, that it is very expensive and you're gonna spend $3,000 on your lab day one. Um, and I can't argue against that. Well, My, we've seen the value. Correct. Um, but that's difficult. It is. And when, you know, we, when, when we look at what we've been through since we opened over seven years ago, or almost seven years ago, if I only, quote, catered, or if I focused our efforts on patients that were willing to spend $3,000, we would not have made it. We would not be, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have made it. Um, I wouldn't have enough patients because there's not that many in in my realm in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where we start, where we started, that would be willing to spend that. And then we, you know, starting out of the gate, people don't have a foundation to say, okay, I I know you, I like you, I trust you, Absolutely. and I'm willing to spend, I'm willing to risk mm -hmm. three thousand dollars. Now we've been open almost seven years, and that that piece has expanded, where. Uh, we get patients from other states and other locations that are willing to do that. But again, I take it very seriously that it is, it is my responsibility to educate them and encourage them to spend their money in a way that's most efficient. So if someone comes in, they say, I'm tired, I'm fatigued. And really, and let's say we spent that $3,000 on labs, but the only problem we found was thyroid. I could have... I could have identified that very quickly and very easily and treated it very easily and very simply and saved them all of this. Right. It, it wouldn't have cost them very much. So usually what I will try to do um, is if a patient, especially if they're kind of close and local and, and we can, let's start with the low-hanging fruit. Let's, let's get a good lab assessment. And really, and we're kind of moving toward this model where most of our patients see you as well mm -hmm. because you can spend more time with them going over again when we talk about what makes someone healthy that's exercise nutrition 
the, in the three R's, mm -hmm. that stress reduction, all those kinds of things. So pieces. it really is foundational that those pieces are addressed. And I would say it's the exception that patients come in and they are 100% dialed in on all of those things. Mm -hmm. And they're still not making right. benefit. It's not saying it's never happened, but that's the exception yeah. and not the rule. So then uh, we also want to dig through, and, and again, when, you know, the, even with our baseline labs, there's so much information that we'll give patients. They walk out. Overwhelmed. There's a, absolutely The overwhelmed. reports are so thick. Yeah. And we've got to consolidate the, all of that and translate it into a way that, mm -hmm. okay, Diana, here's your problem. Here's all your information, <laughs> but here's your problem, and here's where we need to focus our efforts. And they're color-coded, so people get stuck on the colors. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Color-coded meaning that uh, they're, the labs come back in optimal risk, intermediate risk, and high risk so get, for that one lab. And so you get these greens, yellows, and reds, and some people walk out thinking, my gosh, I'm going to die. I've got 80 reds. And it, it's good to help identify potential risk, but uh, just because something's red does not mean right. that's your number one issue. When we get, uh, it, A lot of times attacking the number one makes everything else exactly. shift and fall in place. Exactly. And we see that all the time. It goes back to that spider web. Where if something's off here, mm -hmm. everything else is, and instead of focusing on all of this, focus on this, and then we'll see all of this kind of take care of itself, which is cool. So, um, so why should someone come to us? Um, one, we care. Number two, we're going to work with that patient to try and find what is the underlying problem, and then we want to do it in a cost-effective way that will get them back to their optimal health. And I think we have really good resources to be able to do that. Uh, you know, we, we're growing. We've got, um, you know, our nurse practitioner is fantastic. Our chiropractor who also sees functional medicine patients um, yeah, within the realm of what she can do. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've got a team of providers that some patients may not click with me as well or I click with them as well. We've got a couple of other options for them. Mm -hmm. um, we've got... Uh, you know, you as our life coach. We've got a team of people that can help do all of those things. Additionally, we've got some of the coolest cardiovascular testing in the country. Um, you mm -hmm. know, we, you know how much time and effort and money we've spent on trying Modules to... Modules and training um, and conferences. And, and the equipment. And uh, just the equipment. To absolutely. be able to, uh, to do that. So we've got a comprehensive cardiovascular evaluation program that... Uh, far exceeds anything else in Oklahoma. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, within its within its realm. You know, it's not a uh, uh, you know getting a cath. You know, that still need caths in some cases, but um, we we've, we've got some really cool stuff. As far as non-invasive, I'm not biased. I'm actually blown away at what the information we can get from those and give right. to the patient to really truly make a difference right. in the path they're going to choose for lifestyle um, prevention and and all of those things. Right. And we'll definitely have to have some some stuff on on cardiovascular because it's a, it, well, this will be coming out, but I, I see this all the time. Uh, you know, I work in the emergency room, I mean, you, you know that. Yes, I and <laughs> I see it all the time, and I've got one of our patients who's also a friend, and he's willing to tell his story, and I'll let him tell his story, but 48-year-old male that came in with, and he was actually in the process of doing the cardiovascular evaluation. We found right. multiple things that we were like, we got to work on this. We've got some serious issues that need to be worked on. Uh, but as we still hadn't gotten all of our information yet uh, and all of our testing, but he woke up one morning and had a blind spot in his eye. So and he this, already had a physical manifestation. Correct. And this ended up being a, a, an embolus, uh, you know, a, a piece of something blown oh, off oh, and gosh. went into his eye. And he's got permanent vision loss from it mm. and uh, the cardiologist thinks that it's undiagnosed atrial fibrillation um, that's paroxysmal meaning it comes and goes and he feels great he has no complaints but he has multiple issues with cardiovascular disease and 100 percent occlusion of his right coronary artery and all kinds of stuff when you look at his test you're like you have got to be kidding me he had felt great mm. He felt absolutely fantastic. Had no shortness of breath or so chest pain. They look at like or, the top five things, and they're like, "Do you this, 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 this? Great, you're fine. You're not really at risk." And we and we miss fifty percent of patients with heart attacks. Just like what four hundred? Four hundred known traditional criteria? risk factors. Yeah. Right? 
known risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And we only really cover like five. Five. And those five miss 50%. Oh. And when you miss it, it's not like if you miss it, uh, oh, okay, well, we'll just adjust later down the road. No. If you miss it, you could die. It's, there's no adjustment. And I see it all the time. That's a huge reason alone right. to come here. And just that information is invaluable to what you can do to prepare your family, to prepare yourself to in what you're doing. Right. Um, and not only can we identify a lot of that stuff, but we have protocols to fix it. So the cool thing is, so this patient has an ejection fraction, meaning that his heart's only working uh, at about half capacity. Uh, he's got an ejection fraction of 25%, should be about 50%. And he's like, he's 48. He's like, I'm, I'm going to die. I'm never, mm. well, the rest of my life has changed. And uh, we have a protocol uh, that has a dramatic improvement in cardiac function in congestive heart failure. And my dad's an example of this, but literally um, 100% of patients that have started this protocol have had dramatic improvement. Dr. Houston, who developed this protocol, or at least that's where I learned it, um, had a patient that was in his 40s or 50s, was on a heart transplant list, and had an ejection fraction of 15%. Mm. Uh, there was nothing else they could do for him. It was pure medical management, and uh, said, um, you know, good luck. Mm. And he put him on the protocol, and today, he's off the transplant list. His ejection fraction is greater than 50%. He feels fantastic, better than he's felt in years. All because he looked at what's going on right. and how do we improve this. Not what pill can we give you, but nutritionally what's Underlying. missing. Exactly. Right. All of that underlying. And stuff. it made all the difference in the world. Well, like you said, we don't have a Lortab deficiency. Right. You know, it's what is the problem. Right. We don't have pain because of that. So what's causing it? Right. Um, wow. Okay, so as a new patient, what should my expectations be if I'm starting this journey with with revolution so first appointment um, between 30 minutes and an hour depending on which provider um, and and your needs uh, you'll come in we're gonna do a physical exam we're gonna gain as much history as we can uh, and we'll discuss options for labs you know, you've got tons excuse me tons of options and you've got um, you know everybody comes in with a different budget what different resources what they can uh, or want to do uh, so we'll just work through, um, you know, what what's a good path for each patient, okay. uh, and we'll just we'll work through that, um, and then we'll draw those labs, uh, you know, that day, and uh, then anything that we can identify uh, on their first appointment that okay we need to get started with this right away. You know, we see patients with gut health issues, and uh, we've got a gut protocol in place now that we can give them, but we're working on the, um, the, uh, the gut protocol uh, book or booklet, <laughs> right? Uh, that's got some really cool stuff that you know, no one else is doing. Uh, this, it, it's really, really cool that can make a big difference in oh, a lot of profound. people. Oh, it's profound. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's huge. So um, we're working on that and we'll just, we'll give those protocols uh, where we can. And, and as we develop more of them, we'll put more of those in place so that you've got something actionable to walk away from on day one okay. uh, where we can. But sometimes uh, it's like, I don't know where to start. We need more information in order to be able to start the plan. Labs. Uh, so that's where we start in with the labs. And then uh, I'm almost always going to recommend patients see you for an evaluation. Uh, just like we talked about the um, you know missing forest for the trees and, and then we know that healthy things encompass healthy eating, healthy exercise, uh, and and the three R's: the stress reduction, uh, reducing stress, and and or I mean, reducing stress, recovering from exercise, and and rest or right. sleep. So um, where we we want to focus on those things, and I mean, you do a far better job at that than I do, and you're far, far more better price right, time. And you're far more cost effective mm -hmm. um, for um, for our patients and. You know, it's probably, it's probably in most people's best interest that they come in and see you first. Start with, start with this, and then if we're not making improvements, then come see me, right. um, or one of the other providers. But, uh, and that's not always the case. But sometimes it is. Um, yeah. So, um, the uh, so that's kind of where we'll start on the first appointment. And there is some um, uh, before the patient arrives. 
paperwork. There's some, some definite yeah. paperwork that's online. Yeah, and, and we'll do the, uh, we'll get the information to them where they can go onto the portal and fill that stuff out. Um, and we'll have that information, we'll review it, and we'll be far more efficient in the face-to-face -face time so we can focus more on that patient and what's going on with you and what can we do to make you better. Um, so it's, it really saves a ton of time during that appointment. Um, then, based on the labs that we get, we'll follow up in two to four, sometimes a little bit longer uh, weeks, bring you back, see how you're doing with the plans that we've instituted so far, okay. uh, the protocols, and then we'll go over all of your labs uh, depending on how much lab we get, sometimes we need to block out more time. Oh, like huge, super thick, huge um, amounts of information. Yeah, and it can invaluable. really be overwhelming. Um, you know, it, it is invaluable, uh, but it can be very difficult to distill all that down into a here's your oh. here's your one thing. Right. Um, so uh, the but that that second appointment is where we really start saying, okay, here's really where we need to focus. Okay. Um, you know, here's here's healthy on this spectrum. Here's you. Here's what we need to do to get you over here. Okay. Uh, so that's kind of what to expect. Okay. Um, so I'm going to do my paperwork. I am going to come in, have that initial face-to-face -face with the provider, um, talk about some of the symptoms I'm feeling, noticing, etc. Based on that information, you can kind of create a path, uh, usually involving labs, so that we can definitely get some more information. If there's something that can be done that day, intervention-wise, um, education-wise, I'm walking out the door with that that day. Um, I'm gonna be rescheduled to come back so that when all of that lab work comes back, I'm gonna get a face-to-face -face and a translation of what was found. And then that path gets a little more narrow as to these are the steps that we need to take, these are the things we need to put in place. Correct. Um, so then I'm off to the races. I'm gonna do those things. I'm going to probably have some lifestyle management things that have been advised, so I'm gonna go see me um, and get some of those lifestyle things taken care of. And then three, six years? It depends, it depends. Um, so when, like say we have hormone replacement therapy is the primary thing that we're focusing on. Okay. Um, then we'll institute the hormones, we'll usually follow up at four weeks to see how are you feeling, how are you doing. That doesn't have to be an appointment in the clinic, sometimes that's uh, we just need to check your levels to make sure that we got the right levels. So and levels, you're taking blood again? General, or saliva or urine, depending on okay. how we've done those hormones and kind of what your plan is, okay. what that patient's plan is. Um, and then following up through the portal or, or a phone call, how are you doing? Here are your labs. Here's the adjustments we need to make. Uh, those things are, we want to save people as much money as we can. Those things are relatively simple. They're kind of built into the system, and we're not going to charge for that. Uh, the... Uh, but when it requires an appointment with the provider, me or uh, the nurse practitioner or uh, our chiropractor, the that we have to charge for that because mm -hmm. uh, we have to pay all of those people, you know, for their the, time. The support, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, the if you have a, a a really sick person, you might be doing a four week face to face follow up. Um, you know, if you're really trying to figure out where are we. Uh, but most of the time, it's going to be between three and six months that we're going to follow up and reevaluate how are we doing, repeat those labs, see, uh, you know, it's, a, it's very important that with anything in medicine, if you identify a problem and you institute a therapy to fix the problem, that you reevaluate how is your therapy. It's proper management. And exactly. And if, if in three months we can't demonstrate that it's made any difference, then we need to adjust the therapy. Uh, and so that's that's why we're that's following right. up on those things. Okay, good to know. Very good to know. So let's say I'm very interested that somehow through this video you have gained my trust and I want to come see you and I want to start the revolution journey. What do I need to do? Where do I need to go? Where can I go? Well, you can just ask me. I mean, we, we live together. Yeah. So, oh, you mean the patient? Yeah, would you, would you please help them? Yeah, so... Uh, well, focus. I need you to focus. Well, you said, if I want to. I was like, kind of just tell me. Okay, well, I am representative. <laughs> I see. Do you no, get I it? Yeah, okay. no, I, I got it. All right, so now help them. Help me help them. Okay. Where do they go? <laughs> so you can go to our website, uh, revolutionhealth.org, um, and website link. Um, 
or at least the address. Yes. Uh, or you can call the clinic at 918-935-3636. There are resources there. There's people that can help you schedule an appointment, uh, those kinds of things. That's that's where it starts. Okay. There's um, If you're curious about some of the other um, hot button topics that Doc has, um, you can go listen to the Against the Grain podcast yep. as well. Um, so that can be some, some nice things for you to see some other stuff that he's passionate about and, and really does go against the grain of traditional medicine um, in his thought processes and the way the research reads, actually. Um, and then also you can go to optimallyyou.com and I'll put that as well. Um, and you can kind of look into some of the coaching stuff and how we work in tandem with each other to help revolutionize, revolutionize your health. Make sure you like this video, be sure to subscribe, and then share it with your friends. Help us get the word out. Thanks so much.